new record's called Dreaming of Revenge, and it, um, this time around uh, we focused on doing lots of, lots of melodies mm -hmm. over the top of kind of the, the typical guitar playing that I've done for the past few years. So um, there's lots of acoustic guitar underlying um, these very, very simple but beautiful melodies that are themselves layered, um, layered instruments. So we'd have an electric guitar, a lap steel, a keyboard, you know, playing in unison these melodies. So that, that, that would be the, one of the th th main themes of the record. Right, because your records in the past were, were more uh, about solo guitar performances. Yeah, I did solo guitar performances, and then I did kind of um, more experimental sort of post-rock album that uh, still had a lot of uh, delicate guitar playing, but a lot more electric stuff and a lot more whatnot. So this is, this is still in the same vein as that, it feels. Um, but in terms of, you know, from writing to finishing the record, it went from writing on acoustic guitar and writing acoustic guitar songs again, and then changing them and putting them in, in the studio environment and layering melodies on top and drums and changing the sort of tempos and time codes of them, and yeah. And do you play all the, you know, additional overdub guitar parts and keyboard parts? For the and most part, um, yeah. For the most part, myself and Malcolm, the producer, we we would either play things together. He he played, you know, it was myself and him doing almost everything. I played most of the drums as well. Oh really? And yeah, and um, and but we would sit there and we would play, a, you know, a melody together. We would, you know, I'd work on a guitar part all day, and then we would just rest and play something really simple and beautiful at the end of the day. I've been playing guitar since I was about five years old, and I started off playing classical, little Frere Jaca, things like that. And um, then I had, I stopped taking lessons at a very young age, but then always there was a guitar around that I could play on around my house because my father was a bit of a guitar player as well. And, uh, and I think around age 10 or 11, I kind of started, I started listening to music myself more. Um, stuff that I wanted to listen to as opposed to what my parents were into mm -hmm. and started playing again and also started playing drums at the same time. So between the ages of sort of maybe 9, 10 and 14, I was just doing little blues melodies and rock drums and easy stuff. And then I started listening to guys like Nick Drake and Mark Kozalik, who's uh, founder of the Red House Painters and does Sun Kill Moon now. And um, I was listening to that and then I... Uh, started listening to the older Wyndham Hill records like Alex Agrazzi and Michael Hedges and and I actually remember I was I would listen to these records and go god I know these records so well because I'd heard them in my childhood I just hadn't oh, really yeah, yeah oh, okay. I just hadn't really listened to them in an, in, in an older in my older life and um so somewhere back there that stuff was actually in yeah know, yeah I, well I, I would I remember a song would finish on a record and I, and I would know exactly what the next song would sound like coming up even though I hadn't heard the record in 10 years um and um and then I listened to a bit of, I mean, I was listening to everything at the time, like lots of Britpop and Stereo Lab and The Smiths and The Cure, and um, I just became a bit of a music fanatic. But in terms of, of what I was interested in doing on guitar acoustically, which certainly wasn't the, the main focus of my life at that point, because I was really into playing bass and drums, and that was, that was who I was. I was um, but I did start to uh, finger pick and I did start to start to change the tunings on my guitar because I just realized that you know there's direct I, I'd hit a certain plateau of guitar playing where I could play pretty much all the all the licks and all the power chords and everything in standard tuning and I was either going to go the route of like a great jazz guitar player and learning a, like all the kinds of voicings and things like that or I was going to become more interested in doing like speed metal solos or this sort of third direction kind of presented itself, like, well, let's change tunings and learn how to finger pick really well and incorporate all, like, most, all of those styles, really. You know, the, the, the kind of meaty jazz chords and the, um, you know, the ability to sort of finger pick really, really, really quickly from, like, a classical perspective and, you know, lots of dexterity. So it was, it was all the things I, I was interested in and all the things that guitar players become good at, I kind of brought them all together. Then of course I was playing drums as well, so that was that became a part of my little repertoire as well. Right. Getting bringing the rhythm things and hitting mm -hmm. the instruments. Well it, like it honestly just it wasn't ever thought out. It was it just seemed natural because I was just always thinking about a backbeat or where the pulse is and so yeah. You know, there are guitar fans and uh, music fans that uh 
uh, maybe familiar with someone like Michael Hedges, you know, who got famous for hitting the guitar and two-handed tapping and stuff. Was he an influence for you at all? Uh, um, he was. I didn't become as familiar with his stuff until later and still hadn't really delved in. I think what happened is I, ever, along with listening to, you know, all those guys, Alex DeGrasse and Will Ackerman and Bill Mize, I think I hit Hedges at the wrong era. And I kind of was listening to the Hedges producing his own pop records and singing, which I found horrifying. And so I thought, why does everyone think this guy is so great? And so it wasn't until a few years after that that I actually heard Aerial Boundaries and, um, and Breakfast in the Field. And, was, and I said, oh, well, obviously this is why, this, this is this man's legacy. It's not singing, you know, Sheila E. covers, obviously, so, uh, which he did. Um, so yeah, Hedges certainly was an influence and, and an inspiration and an interesting person to research because I think he died when I was about 16 years old. And so um, I had never gotten to sort of be a fan, I suppose. I'd actually seen him play when I was four. Oh, wow. And I have one, I have a very vague memory of that show. But, um, uh, but so, so Hedges kind of became more of, of, of a, like a catalog artist to go back and, yeah. and delve into and get interested in. Um, but he sort of wasn't as important to me as some of the certain other guitar yeah. players. You were well on your path, is what you're saying. When uh, you really yeah, I, I, suppo I suppose so. Fan, you know? And and I, I mean, I, I remember learning Aerial, Aerial Boundaries and and the song and um, and and listening to that record a lot and thinking, God, this is this is incredible stuff. But having it was kind of I was yeah, you're right. I was well into what I was doing already. It wasn't like I had an epiphany. Which a lot of people did have when they heard that record for well, the yeah, first time, right. you know. So I, I, I had already had that epiphany several years back, I suppose. Early on, I was writing lyrics and I was singing, but it just I wasn't as interested in that as I was in playing and writing compositionally something that was more interesting. And also, I think that because it was so difficult to play what I was playing and sing over the top of it, it, it seemed to just, everything would run into each other. So I just stopped the singing part and I started, you know, really focusing on how I can make these guitar songs really interesting by themselves. Right. That's almost like the typical guitar player problem. It's like, okay, I've come up with this fabulous thing on guitar, now I'm going to sing over it. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, but it's, you I can't, can't sing over this. Well, it's either you can't do it physically or it just doesn't sound right. right. It's just the, the, the two things don't really meld together. Do you have any, uh, like, one tuning that you use primarily? Well, um, you know, I used to, and one of the uh, one of the ways I was able to write the new album was by completely breaking away from the tunings that I was into, and coming up with a whole new set, or just experimenting and or tunings that I'd always wanted to get into um, using them. So. I used to rely really heavily on C, G, D, G, A, D. That was my, that was kind of like my fallback position. Dad, Gad, and, and then C, G, D, G, A, D were, were always, they were always somewhere in the, in the mix. And once I stopped playing in the tunings that I was really familiar with, it led to this uh, sort of self-imposed self creative, uh, I shouldn't say that, it's more like a, um, it's like a self-limiting system of creativity where there's only so much you can do. Your fingers aren't going to tell you where to go. They're not familiar with the typical chord shapes and things you're used to. And so therefore you, you're sort of forced into creating something new, whether you like it or not. And so for the new record, I, I, I mean, I haven't even memorized them all. I couldn't really list them off the top of my head. I have them all written down somewhere. But for the new rec record, I basically would, I started picking up guitar and just tuning it and just something very, very different and then went with it. <laughs> 